How is everyone doing? Strength Chat episode 80, and today I have got a very special guest for you. I last spoke to this guy back in uh, January this year for episode 51. He's the co-founder and the chief sports scientist at Renaissance Periodization. He's also a former professor of sport and exercise science. Today I am joined by Dr. Mike Isriatel. How are you doing? Good, good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to chat with me again. Um, what's been happening since we last spoke in uh, January? What have you been up to? Well, we uh, had a real interesting year at RP. We um, had just launched the RP Diet app back then. And since then, the app has gotten many, many improvements and has been gaining steadily in user base, which is really awesome. There are now tens of thousands of people that use the app regularly. Yeah. So it's really cool. We're making more advancements all the time. I actually just uh, I finished some work today where I updated, we sort of redesigned all the core algorithms that run the app and determine its nutritional partitioning and how it makes decisions about when to reduce calories, when to increase them by how much, depending on what options. And uh, it's just super, super cool. Um, so it's been, that's been the big story so far and there's all other, other really good stuff in the works that I can't talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when you mentioned the, um, the RP app, uh, when we last spoke, um, when it, when it got, uh, all came out and, um, when I've been seeing people using it, I'm like, ah, oh, I spoke to Mike about that. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. And, um, seeing everything that you've put out there about it, the feedback seems to be really, um, really good there hasn't been uh, no one seems to be really struggling with with it is that what you've expected from it or did you expect it to be as successful as obviously as it is you know i try to come at these things with as few expectations as possible we're trying to do a good job i think we did fine we can always do better and we're always improving it the steps with the app was always to release um what in they think the tech industry is called a minimum viable product where you release something that's at the very least gonna make people happy uh, and it's not anywhere close to perfect. The interesting comment on the tech industry and software development is that if you don't release a piece of software and you just keep coming up with ideas to improve it and you keep improving it without releasing it and try to make it perfect, you will almost by definition never release it. Yeah. Because you always have better ideas and yeah. it's almost like the analogy is uh, folks that do program hopping, like they want to make their program perfect, so they're always tweaking it, and they never actually put anything, you know, like put their hands on any iron and, and lift weights for yeah. a consistent enough amount of time. So uh, what we did was we released this MVP, Minimum Vital Product, in November, and then we sort of, when we released it, and this is kind of the nature of the industry, we already knew that it had a bunch of things we could be doing better. Um, and then we got more insight on things we could do better because users will tell you when they don't like something or they think, yeah. hey, you know, like, this is nice, but what about this? And then we've been slowly, as, as quickly as we can, adding those features and cleaning up the bugs and so on and so forth. And so far we've had like, gee, you know, three major feature additions and one big redesign. And it just, you know, basically every time one of those comes out, you get some problems with bugs, which is always inevitable. And then a week or two later, the bugs cool down. And then you have a group of people that previously said that the app wasn't so great or not in such nice terms, said much worse things. <laughs> um, then you have them saying now either that it's great or it's much better or they just don't say anything much at all because a lot of times when people are satisfied, they just sort of say nothing and yeah. just use it. So um, we basically had the um, opportunity to, uh, you know, satisfy like more and more and more percent of our target market, which yeah. is really sweet. Um, and another interesting thing is like, you know, like when we were talking with other developers, which we ended up not going with, and we actually got super lucky on the team we have, you know, they were saying like, once the app comes out, you need to have like a launch party, which is, I don't barely know what that is. It's apparently you look at like reporters and have like champagne and talk about how great your app is. Um, that is so antithetical to everything like we stand for at RP, which is just like science-based results with zero bullshit. And <laughs> yeah. That just sounds like a whole lot of bullshit. But when you have a launch party and things, you try to make a big splash, you end up getting a lot of people to use your app at first. And before you've gone through this process of making it better and better and better, 
So the cool thing about this sort of like organic improvement of the app, like we have users, they tell us what they like, what they don't, we make it better. They tell us what we like, we don't, we make it better. And also we have a ton of our own ideas of just making it better over time. And what ends up happening is like you start with a user base. We didn't even talk about the app in public for the first several months. We just talked about it in our Facebook clients group, RP clients, uh, people who have bought our templates before and other digital products from us. And um, we knew that RP clients was going to be pumped about the app anyway, that those folks are just like super, super enthusiastic. And we told them like, listen, this is a work in progress. Luckily it's dirt cheap. So you don't have anything to lose. And the first two weeks are free, but we knew that they weren't going to judge us as harshly as the yeah. grand audience. So there was never an incentive for us to like super crazy advertise the app up front. As the app is getting better and better, like I think on the iTunes and Google Play Store were like 4.5, 4.6 rating, which was like with several hundred or several thousand ratings. This is really good. And it's always climbing a little slowly. So now that we're like, uh, we have a really good product, and uh, now we're sort of starting to bump up the advertising and talk right. to more people about it. And then uh, it just gets more users and gets better. And that whole process is yeah. recursive. So I, I would say the interesting analogy is kind of like just to somebody's lifting career in general. Like, it's so funny when people do like one powerlifting meet or something and they're like, I'm going to make an announcement. I'm going to be best in the world one day. Like I've literally <laughs> heard people say that and you're like, why would you say that? Like, why don't you just train and get better and get better and get better? And then as you get better, you'll pick up more, more followers or whatever it is you're into with Instagram. There's a lot of people too with social media. They'll ask like, how do I get more followers? Like, mm, I'm pretty sure followers come if you're like worthwhile. Yeah. The next question you ask is how do you get more worthwhile? You, you study and train and apply and help clients and show off your results and, builds like that it's yeah, organic absolutely. growth right and yeah. and that's the kind of growth that when you do get followers or you do get business or you do get results that's the kind of stuff that's going to last and it's going to be really impactful versus if you just yeah. say like hey new revolutionary whatever i'm this new me and follow me and uh, then what is there to follow i actually had a like now that i'm ranting <laughs> this kid like uh commented on one of my pictures on instagram and he was like Hey man, like, um, just let you know who I am and would, I would appreciate the follow. This this kid is like, you know, lift weights and he's like 16 years old and honest profile is like, I'm 16 years old. Like, I guess he's sort of jacked for a 16 year old, which is like, you know, like the, the fastest three legged dog or something like that. Same idea. Um, and it's, it's like, I just, you know, I was like, I, I guess I was moody that day, but I took the time and sort of like an Eric Helm style to politely explain to him that his presumption is completely incorrect, that you do not ask for follow. You simply don't ask for follow. <laughs> yeah. not the, and, and also like, I, I also went so far as to tell him, as I think he sort of tried to debate me a little bit. I was like, in a very polite way, I was like, you're 16 years old, man. Like, I'm sure you got a lot of good stuff going on, but you're not exactly like a reservoir of wisdom, uh, you know? <laughs> like let your action speak, let your accomplishments speak for themselves, let your knowledge, yeah. put out knowledge, put out an Instagram post that really makes me think I'll follow you right away, man. But, but if you say like, you hey, follow me, it's like, why you're a 16 year old kid. Like, <laughs> as a matter of fact, forget I even said the age, anyone, <laughs> any age, why the hell would I follow you? Like if you need to tell people why they should be following you, people yeah. don't need to be following. You. Yeah. It's funny. We spoke about this in the, uh, the gym that I work out and we're, we were chatting about um, you know the content that we that we put out there, and um, one of the other coaches mentioned you know we don't just want to put random stuff out there, um, especially if it's related to yes you can put funny posts out and that sort of stuff, but if it's actually supposed to be content that ultimately the end goal is that someone's going to learn something from it or take something away so that they can improve their training or nutrition or whatever it whatever it is that's just free content out there that's going to benefit somebody. Um, and if people feel, um, feel the need to follow and think, do you know what, actually, you know, I like the content that that guy or that person's putting out there. Yeah. Give it, give it a follow. Um, rather than, yeah. Um, follow me, follow me. Look what I, look what I do instead of, you know, what's the actual content that you're, that you're actually putting out there. Um, 100%. Yeah, but with the with the app, you know, really, really glad that you know it's it's taken off. And like I say, when I um, seeing people using it, yeah, I think is 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 awesome, especially after you know speaking to you um, uh, back in back in January. Uh, so, what's been going on with your own training, and um, have you been delivering any seminars? Because last time we spoke, um, obviously, calendar was was dead busy. What's uh, what's on that side? Tons, man. I was in Aust. We were our P team was in Australia. We're going to Canada in a couple days here. Um, we're going to be in the United Kingdom 
uh, in London. Um, we're going to be at uh, the uh, EPC Powerlifting Conference. Um, myself and Gabriel Fandaro from RP, and then uh, I think Greg Knuckles is going to be there, and Eric Helms, and it's going to be a super blast. And then um, later uh, in the year, I think I have like GM speaking at a USA Weightlifting conference, a coaches co conference in Miami in the United States. We're going to Korea. We have a seminar booked in oh, Korea. Wow. I've never been to Korea. Yeah, it's funny. My my two very good friends and uh, one of them is my training partner. He's they're uh, Korean by heritage and right. uh, uh, they speak Korean and shit. So they signed. They get they got the seminar going. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's going to be really trippy. And then uh, later we might be. Um, uh, I'm almost certainly doing India again and going to um, Singapore, probably Hong Kong and. The road continues. The travel is for me like uh, it's just it's super fun. I really wish my wife could go with me. She's a medical doctor, so she's too busy. Oh, okay. but when she comes with me, I'll travel probably even more. Yeah. But uh, I only go for weekends and a little bit at a time. But it's super cool to connect with people and stuff and do yeah. a little theoretical discussion. And you actually they sort of develop friends across the world, and you, it's cool yeah. to talk. To them. Yeah. Basically, by the world, I mean places the uh, the United Kingdom has conquered before. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was just mentioning there about uh, about great. It's cool to go see new uh, to go see new places as well that um, you haven't oh, yeah. been for, which hundred percent, which would be pretty pretty good. And um, all, you know, when you mentioned in there about you know traveling the world, even though I'm um, you know just based in Leeds and speaking to people, you know, not just in the UK but across, it's um, yeah, it's good to uh, be able to speak with you know the likes of such yourself from um, you know. Uh, in, in different countries, which you might not get the likelihood to speak to. And um, it was funny, I um, I spoke to, uh, I actually went and trained at another gym. And someone, at, well, the, I, I asked if I could use their platform and they actually recognized my voice. And they said, oh, are you from the, uh, from the uh, are you Steve from the Strength Chat podcast? And I said, yeah. I said, oh, it was quite nice to put a, a face to the, uh, a voice to the, uh, fit. yeah. Face to the voice. Face to the voice, that's it. That's what I was in yep. for. Um, and the feedback was, you know, that, um, sometimes, especially because I like to, I post it on Spotify, iTunes and YouTube, but the fact that I always quite like to uh, see people face to face because it is, it, then it is like a conversation. And, you know, I like to think that when people are listening, his feedback was, it did sound like just a conversation that yes, you are talking about topics, but you know, there's tangents on other things as well, which, um, I thought was re really good. Um, hopefully it'll get to a point where. Yeah, if I've got enough money in the bank, I'll be able to um, go and do live uh, podcasts over in the, uh, in the US or anything like that. Totally. That would be great. Um, so for uh, everyone chatting, obviously, uh, you did a little bit of a background to yourself uh, in the first episode. But for any new listeners and the fact that it's been on iTunes now for the past couple of, past couple of months uh, for episodes going forward, just want to give a little bit of a background to yourself for anyone that either doesn't know how you got to uh, be in the position that you're now or who didn't watch or listen to the, to the previous episode that we... Yeah, totally. No worries. So... Um... I got uh, interested in lifting weights in high school when I was a wrestler, and then I did powerlifting in college, and then I did my master's degree in strength and conditioning, and I got a chance to coach a lot of uh, pretty good collegiate athletes, and then I went and did a year of personal training in New York City, and uh, that was alongside my business partner, Nick Shaw, and at the time, we were just working for another personal training company. I realized I need to learn a lot more. I got my PhD. I went back and got my PhD in sport physiology. And I began to be a professor for four years. And during this time, we also started RP to help people with their fitness goals. RP eventually got so big that it's uh, swallowed up my professor job and I don't have to go to a professor job anymore, which I sometimes miss. Um, and uh, during also the sort of like the RP time, I got really interested in bodybuilding. And I've competed a couple times to very little avail. But... Um, I've managed to put on a whole lot of muscle and especially this last uh, fat loss phase, I got really, really lean, which is really cool to see. Um, so yeah, I also, I guess I'm a jujitsu grappler, uh, my purple belt um, under, under Phil and Rick Migliarese and balance studios, Philadelphia, USA. And uh, yeah, so I live the a sports scientist by training and I'm a sports scientist by life. So I, uh, I mostly, my life is either I'm training 
or uh, I am sitting right in this very chair and writing algorithms for software uh, or books, and or I'm spending time with my my wife uh, watching usually really stupid shit on TV. Like uh, <laughs> we'll get into a dumb show and watch it to completion. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I'm glad I'm not the only one. I like a little bit of uh, yeah, um, dumb mindless uh, mindless TV. You know what? If you want TV, if you want mindful stuff, that's you read books, you listen to podcasts. I turn on TV; it's exclusively dumb shit. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad I'm not the. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Um, so it doesn't feel as bad that when I've come in and I just, um, yeah, after um, working and you know chatting with people and everything, just yeah, it's sometimes good to uh, to, to mindlessly watch um, watch. Hundred percent. Well, I was chatting yeah. to one of the other coaches, and uh, we ended up watching Rick and Morty um, for uh, for a couple of a couple of series, which uh, uh, yeah, it was good, good. My wife and I are just starting. I know it was really behind. We're just starting season three. And the first episode of season three was, was unbelievable. Uh, I'm a big, big Rick and Morty fan. My training partner, Jared Feather, if he ever listens to this, is going to kill me because I'm so, he is the biggest Rick and Morty fan. Like, he has the clothes. Um, he eats, like, Rick and Morty cereal. No joke. Um, so uh, the fact that I hadn't watched season three yet was, like, a real big rift in our relationship. But we're working on it. So yeah. I'll let you know. At least you catch you know. Totally. For sure. <laughs> Um, so last time we spoke, um, we covered uh, basically all things hypertrophy about programming and um, you know a little bit of, uh, of nutrition as well. Um, but one thing that uh, I want you to chat to you about today, um, from watching some of the content that you've um, put out there, is exercise selection. So when it comes to exercise selection. Um, there's always exercises that some people are going to prefer um, to do compared to others, and uh, that's the same for, for coaches as well. But when it comes to choosing the exercises, are there actually some exercises that are better than others? And is there a, 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 a hierarchy of exercises, if you like? Yeah. Would you like me to address that from the perspective of hypertrophy, strength, or one and then the other? Uh, one and then the other. I know that was, yeah, maybe should have been a little bit more specific with that. It's no, 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 totally fine. Yeah. Um, cool. I'll address hypertrophy first, uh, and then strength. Yeah. As they should be sequenced properly for, uh, uh, for most athletes or for strength training athletes. Um, okay. So hypertrophy training, we can actually, uh, develop some sort of quantitative, at least theoretical understanding of how to rank exercises according to their effectiveness. And I've developed such an index, and I have termed it the stimulus to fatigue ratio. Um, now, like, fuck it, why not? Let's make this. Like, are you okay with me getting a little bit advanced? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the benefit of your of your viewers and possibly to their confusion. So there are three um, three indices that uh, myself and and uh, and my colleagues at RP have developed quite recently. Are, we've been using them in some sense for a while, but we formalized them recently. Yeah. We're eventually going to be putting them into the, we already put them into the book. Or eventually we're going to release the book, uh, Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training. It'll be in there and be very well described. So uh, the first index uh, that you can use is the most simple is what we call a raw stimulus magnitude. It is the degree of muscle growth any exercise causes per unit of rep or set. Right? So like you do a set of squats versus a set of leg press versus a set of leg extension versus a set of, you know, like ballet, PA yeah. squat. And you can potentially rank order those exercises based on how much muscle growth that one set causes or any number of equated sets. And this has been tested directly in the laboratory for a few exercises, but there's not much testing. So we have to usually use proxy measurements. And there are some things that correlate rather well with hypertrophy, uh, pretty poorly by themselves, all together pretty decently, decently yeah. enough for us to begin to form uh, at least our best guess. So, for example, uh, if you get a, a robust muscle pump, like a cell swelling effect, uh, you're probably going to grow in some muscle. Um, the better the pump, probably the more muscle you grow. This is because the cell swelling effect mechanistically seems to affect muscle growth and also probably correlates to homeostatic disruption with, and other things that grow muscle like metabolite and sequestration. So if you get a pump, you're probably growing. If you feel uh, what I could uh, call tension throughput through the target muscle, 
It's, uh, and to the extent that you feel it, that's probably indicator of the tension development in the target muscle, and thus also predictive of hypertrophy. For example, if I taught you how to squat, like sitting really far back and sitting on your heels and um, uh, going pretty shallow depth and low bar, you might not feel like your quads are doing a whole lot, right? Someone's like, can you yeah. feel that in your quads? And you're like, mm, yeah, I guess. And then someone taught you how to squat high bar with a weightlifting shoe completely up and down and some and very deep. You know that when you're squatting, that deep sensation of the quads fucking just pulling and you're like, I'm going to rip my knees off my body. Like that is probably highly related to hypertrophic stimulus, especially when comparing multiple exercises. You know, like guys will try a couple different chest press machines. The question of which one do you feel your chest on more is a pertinent question. It's a real thing. You could call it mind muscle connection, but you can just call it perception of tension through good through the target muscle. And so that's going to be predictive of muscle growth to some extent. Um, how, if do you develop DOMS in the target muscle and how many sets it takes? Now, that's not a very tight correlation, but it does give some value. There's probably an optimal level of soreness uh, to get, which is probably either no soreness or just a little bit of soreness. A ton of soreness means you're doing way too much muscle damage. It's probably counterproductive. Yeah. But if you can train yourself with 10 sets of something and not get any soreness at all in a target muscle, you have to ask if you're doing enough volume or if the exercise just sucks. Yeah. So for example, if you do find a leg press machine where you do like four sets and it tortures your quads versus one where you do 10 sets and you barely feel anything the next couple of days, like, man, I think that one machine was just more stimulating. Like it. It's not that muscle damage cause and muscle growth. It might, but it's unlikely. Uh, it's probably that the same things that cause muscle damage, like a ton of tension throughput through the muscle, the yeah. cell swelling effect, metabolites, um, uh, that probably also cause hypertrophy. So if you're, you got an exercise that like, if you do a lot of it, it'll get you sore. If it gets you robust pumps with fewer, few, very few sets, if it if a lot of tension throughput, another one, and this is more for a targeting question versus a stimulus question. Um, you know, do you with high repetitions and short rests accumulate, uh, metabolites in the muscle? Like, do you get a burn? For example, uh, I, I I'm, uh, quite certain a lot of people have experienced this. You try a, a curling variation and you go to failure and someone's, someone can say like, where do you feel that? Where's the burn? And a lot of people, you know, you expect that they're going to be like, yeah, it's right here. But some of your clients are like, it's right here, right? Like if that's the muscle that gets the burn, it's probably also the limiting factor, which probably means the muscles high, uh, the biceps, uh, highest, uh, you know, highest end motor units are probably never being fully recruited and thus the tension throughput is probably not that high. And it's probably not as much bicep hypertrophy as you get. They, I'll tell you what, if you're trying to get big arms, and all the curls you're doing, you feel limited by your forearms because the lactate accumulation is so great. Gee, you know, I just wouldn't guess that you're getting the best hypertrophy in your biceps. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, basically, there's a couple other factors, but those are sort of the top ones we're looking for. And you can rank exercises on sort of how many sets of an exercise it takes to really check the boxes to some average extent. Yeah. Right? And then so you could say like, hey, you know, what do you think is better for your legs? squats or leg extensions and of course variation plays a role where you do squats long enough then they become so stale that leg extensions are better but if you had to just rough average it you know like yeah like high bar deep squats are probably more stimulative per set than leg extension you do a yeah. set of 10 and leg extensions and you're like eh. you just set a 10 of the squats you're like holy quads or some shit really really happened to me yeah. but the last thing i'll say for this particular sub point is individual differences are really really critical so this index is not something you just tell people about. You work with your clients and your athletes and yourself, and you ask them to rank these and perceive these things. How much soreness was caused? How much tension did you feel in this exercise versus that one? How much lactate accumulation occurred with higher reps? And so on and so on and so on. How big of a pump did you get? Where some people will gravitate towards preferring certain exercises. And preferring is almost the wrong term. Detecting that these exercises are, are more stimulative by proxy to them than others. It's, you know, like you can't preach like people say like, hey, Dr. Mike, our leg press is better than squats, like, uh, or better than hack squats. I'm like, you know, that is not an answerable question. The real question is when you do leg presses versus hack squats, which ones do you feel are getting you the most pumps or blah, 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 blah per yeah. unit sets? And then that's your answer, right? And of course, variation means you'll still use one and then the other one and then the other on a rotating basis. But let's say you did 10, you're familiar with 10 quadricep exercises and you've sort of gone through and at least informally, like just kind of at least in your head, because we all do this in our head. Like you can tell, you can tell me off the top of your head which chest exercise gives you the biggest pack pumps. Like I'm sure you yeah. What is it? Well, why don't, why don't you tell us to for shit? Uh, mine is mine is the dumbbell bench press. Um, yeah. yeah, 
easy. Because like as soon as I say, "Where's the biggest pack, pack pump you ever got?" You like remember that time we did a dumbbell bench. You're like, "Oh my god, like my chest is gonna blow off." On as a time, right? as a as a power lifter after after a competition, when you get a little bit of a you know the the hypertrophy phase, if you like, and you get to play around with the dumbbells, yeah, you walk out thinking, "Oh my god, this is so much better than barbell bench press." <laughs> for, sure, for sure. So basically, you know, people, you can rank your own. Uh, stimulus indices or raw stimulus magnitudes to where like if you have 10 quad exercises or 10 chest exercises 10 lat exercises at the very least you can rank a top five and a bottom five right like let's say you use top two you're like who knows it's 50 50 right top three could be you know 33 each but um you know you can at the very least jettison exercises that just probably don't do a fucking thing if people ask me, like, do you ever do sissy squats? I'm like, no. I tried them a couple times. They sucked. They were just not. I mean, just nothing's happening, right? For me, leg extensions. Some people love them. I, one of my uh, colleagues, James Hoffman, uh, loves leg extensions because they really torture his quads. Uh, they just don't do shit for me. So I just almost never use them because it would be fucking stupid. So we're not saying that you need to pick the best exercise. But, you know, you have a rotation of exercises, maybe, you know, three to six exercises that you're going to be using for the majority of your career training um, per muscle group. And it's a good idea to sort of know at least where your, your big boys are. Like, you know, if you travel, you show up to a gym, you look at their back machines, you're like, well, that one sucks. I know use that one. That sucks. That one's great. I'm going to use that one. You know what I mean? They get really good dependable training. So that's raw stimulus magnitude. It's great. It's a great index. Uh, problem is it leaves out something. It leaves out the amount of fatigue and exercise also causes. So if I had to give the best trap and spinal erector exercise, I would say the deadlift can't be beat. Okay. But if someone told me they needed bigger traps in the context of an already voluminous and fatiguing bodybuilding program or powerlifting program, I would have to consider that we need the raw stimulus magnitude as high as possible. Also, we would need an, a proxy measure for fatigue because you can't just stick in. So every stimulus comes in with its own level of fatigue. Like it can yeah. be this much fatigue or maybe the stimulus is a little smaller, but it's this much fatigue. Yeah. So you can stack more of them into the same program. Or if you have just one little part to stack, the fatigue doesn't overwhelm the rest of the program and, and, and get you just beat up. So for example, imagine a power lifter, a client of yours felt like you look at his traps, his traps are small. He has trouble really like standing up with the weight and he's, you know, basically shoulder slump too far forward and it ruins his pull mechanics. You're like, okay, you probably need bigger traps, right? You need bigger, stronger traps. Um, if he's already a pretty decent deadlifter, or at least, you know, deadlifting is very fatiguing and he does squats and bench and he's in the context of a full program, are you really going to program more deadlifts to get his trap traps bigger? No. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, you're not. Like, you're <laughs> going to say, okay, I mean... If fatigue was not a concern, we would just do more deadlifts because they grow your traps like nothing else. But we're going to do shrugs. Yes, they're a little lamer. No, they probably don't go traps as much because the overall load just not as high. But, you know, we're going to put them in because fatigue-wise, they don't have to get them come off the ground and maybe there's an advantage, right? Yeah. So we end up developing a second index uh, called the stimulus to fatigue ratio, the SFR. And that is just to take the stimulus in the numerator and the fatigue in the denominator. You divide them and you see which number is higher, which one's lower. And the higher the total number is, uh, the higher that ratio, the better it is. Yeah. So how would you estimate fatigue? Well, there's a couple ways. One is just on performance. Um, what is the effect of the exercise on performance of um, similar movements? And then what is the exercise? Uh, the, what is the effect of the exercise on performance of non-similar movements? For example. How, how systemically fatiguing is the deadlift versus the uh, trap bar shrug? Well, you know, you do deadlifts for five sets of 10 and or you do or, or you do trap bar shrugs for five sets of 10, two different workouts. And then you bench after, the, after those two different workouts and you see how well your bench performance holds up. You, you know, you don't have to have lifted longer than about a month to realize that after five by 10 deadlifts, you might not ever get to bench press. You might just die right yeah. there. Um, but after five by 10 shrugs, you're like kind of sort of pretty warmed up to go bench and you'll have a great workout probably. Yeah. Right. So that's a good measurement of systemic fatigue, which is, you know, very, very important to consider because it's going to infect the rest of your program. Uh, another one, uh, fatigue is multiple pathways and causes is joint distress. Like per any exercise, 
how much does it hit your muscles versus your joints? Like you could have a leg press that really beats up your quads, which is great, but it also twerks your knees a little bit. And this other leg press you can use, and you have to do more sets because it doesn't torture quads as much, but it's perfect for your knees and it never hurts them. Like, gee, I don't know. It's probably kind of important to do the one that doesn't exact a whole lot of fatigue. Another quick fatigue indica indicator is uh, we can call joint doms. Um, like delayed onset joint soreness, which is it doesn't yeah. feel like muscle soreness, but you know, like the day after, you're like, oh, the hell happened to my shoulders? Like yeah. it felt fine during. It's going to catch up to you, and eventually it's a huge downside. So with the stimulus to fatigue ratio, we have what I've sort of called the, the, the golden fleece of exercise selection for uh, a very serious uh, athlete, a very serious hypertrophy trainee. Because in the context of, of working super hard and doing a lot of work, in the context of a um, being able to reach your top fatigue limits, your maximum recoverable volume, if you've, you're within range of it, the SFR of any given exercise is highly important because if you pick high stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises, in other words, exercises that have stimulus is high relative to how much fatigue they have, yeah. you just, it, we're one of two things. You're going to be able to stack more other exercises and body parts into that program because the fatigue is the limiting for, uh, factor for stacking. And or you're going to be able to stack just more of that exercise. It's just, you know, four sets of bench is better than two. And if bench beats you up so much, you can't do any more than two. Maybe four sets of dumbbell press is better for your chest hypertrophy, right? Mm -hmm. So the SFR is super important. And then lastly, not as important, but for general populations, is the SFTR, uh, stimulus to fatigue time ratio. And um, that is, you could also call it the efficiency ratio, is uh, how much... Uh, you know, effort, how much stimulus to fatigue, SFR, uh, can you put in in a very constricted amount of time, right? And, and, and that is an important question. Uh, it actually, you can sometimes take out the, uh, the fatigue altogether and just look at uh, stimulus to time ratio. And basically, like, imagine you have a regular person who comes to see you two or three times a week for personal training. And you're realistically, they're never going to be able to do enough work in the gym with 45 minutes, three times a week to reach their MRV from a physiological perspective. It's just never going to happen. Like the training based MRV is uh, 20 sets per week. And the most they can do is 10. It's yeah. just never mm -hmm. even in range. And for them, you want the most stimulus that you can. Fatigue is not a concern at all. Or even if it is and you factor fatigue in, what you want to know is what exercises are really good bang for the buck exercises. Um, uh, I could do fewer sets of them yeah. and get a shitload of stimulus uh, and uh, be out the door and have that much better for my fitness, which almost the uh, a real life experiment of the highest uh, efficiency ratio exercises are the ones CrossFitters use. Let's think about CrossFit classes are very limited time, only a couple of times a week. They will use the exercises that fuck you up the most. So what do they do? They do a ton of burpees and kettlebell swings and high rep deadlifts and high pulls and all this other crazy stuff, almost always compound moves, almost always uh, superset and alternate uh, compound supersets like pushing versus pulling, curling versus extending, so on and so forth. I mean, that has the highest stimulus uh, to time ratios. And in situations in which you work with real clients in the real world, those are the exercises that tend to be most prized. Um, so you go, you know, it's interesting. We start with deadlifts are the best for building traps and erectors for raw stimulus magnitude. They're not even close to the best for those muscles, especially traps in a stimulus to fatigue ratio. But if you go to stimulus to time ratio, deadlifts are a pretty good option again because, gee, they fuck a lot of shit up in real short order. Like if you have a client coming in and they can, start, let's say, only train 20 minutes, you might have them superset deadlifts to push-ups one after the other after the other with just a little bit of break for air and then superset squats to pull-ups or to bent rows and there's a whole body training with four exercises in 20 minutes and they will get a lot of stimulus now they get a shitload of fatigue but who cares if they only train for 20 minutes how much fatigue can you really in, in the absolute yeah. values yeah. right so that answers the question for hypertrophy of what are the best exercises it's ones that rank highest on either one of those three indices depending on your needs if yeah. you're a beginner lifter and you just want hypertrophy and you're so just starting out so you're so weak uh, that you do fatigue is not really a realistic concern you just need to put raw stimulus magnitude exercises are the ones you want to pick if you are getting more advanced and you'll train a lot and you're a power lifter a bodybuilder strength athlete stimulus to fatigue ratio is your best bet 
And then if you're training regular gen pop folks that don't have a lot of time but want a lot of like body composition change and strength, so on and so forth, then you do uh, stimulus to time ratio exercises. Um, and the, and those, those all can be ranked. And the ranking is, is relatively informal. And it's you know, you, something you do either on a piece of paper or in your phone or in your head. But it's nonetheless, like we all do it to some extent anyway. Might as well put some names on the stuff and formalize it. For strength, it's all the same indices, but you got to measure them a little bit differently. So instead of how big of a pump something gives you, um, what you want to do is, is measure its effect on your strength performance. Now, that effect, it takes a while. It can take a month or two to figure out the transfer effect, so on and so forth. But uh, in, uh, luckily, in uh, strength, we can also have uh, the, the um, principle of specificity helps us a lot. So exercises that feel like the competitive movement, feel the transfer of the competitive movement, and biomechanically are similar to the competitive movement, usually have the higher raw stimulus magnitudes for strength improvement um, and have the higher uh, stimulus to fatigue ratios, so on and so forth. So for example, if you asked me what the best way was to grow triceps for bench pressing, and we had two exercises, we have one arm overhead tricep extensions, okay, and we had the other was a JM style skull crusher where you just yeah. get your elbows in. I'm sorry, like, eh, 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 like that, right? Yeah. And we could ask the question of you know which one of those is probably going to enhance strength in bench pressing more. Well, which one's more biomechanically similar to the bench press? It's clearly the JM presses. Yeah. Which ones involve the musculature that's relevant to pressing? Because, you know, the overhead dumbbell extension, the long head of your triceps back here, that is actually involved in shoulder extension. And it is even so it doesn't um, occur in bench pressing. It's not a thing. It's actually shoulder flexion in bench pressing. So it almost counteracts it, right? So, like, if you have someone who could dumbbell overhead extend a lot, it's not really super clear that they're going to be that much better of a presser. If you, someone can jam a lot, you're like, okay, you're clearly going to be pressing a lot. Um, and then just visually the exercise is one much more similar to the other. And then from a mind muscle connection perspective, sort of from a perceptual perspective, this one feels a whole lot like the, the JM press, especially at the top when you're tired, feels a whole lot like struggling against a really tough bench. And if, if someone's like, Hey man, you really feel it here as a power lift, you'd be like, yeah, I guess like my triceps, but it feels nothing like pressing. <laughs> and, and also there's a, a, another interesting layer to this for powerlifting. The, uh, degree of similarity of loading on the various tissues and including the nervous system has to be accounted for. So when you JM press, you can do like maybe, you know, 60 to 100 kilos if you're really strong. And that's like 60 to 100 kilos in your hands, throughput, tension, through everything. Um, that's important to feel if you're going to transfer it to heavy bench pressing because it neurologically trains you to get to do a lot of tension throughput through the triceps. Yeah. But like a one-arm dumbbell extension, I mean, look, if you go close to failure, yeah, the individual muscle fibers get a lot of tension, but the total muscular tendinous unit that ever experiences high tension, what's this going to be, 10 kilos, 20 kilos if you're really strong? So um, it, it's, it's something that just ends up being uh, like, yeah, the muscle grows, but the nervous system and the structural architectural changes, the technique transfer is not nearly as high. Um, and then you end up having exercises that aren't as great. So in powerlifting, we can rank exercises on stimulus. The fatigue, by the way, is exactly the same for powerlifting. Yeah. Uh, but the fatigue is like which exercises are more similar to the competition movements, which ones when you're struggling with them feel similar like the struggling competition movements, which ones biomechanically are replicate the, the parts of the movements that you want to get better, um, and which ones allow you to experience higher levels of absolute tension so that they're getting going to be getting you stronger, not just on hypertrophy grounds, but on other grounds. And, you know, clearly, like if you have to ask which movement is the best to enhance low bar squatting for, you know, low bar squats win that automatically, right? Which is why yeah. power of the specificity is super important to power because strength is much more specific than hypertrophy by definition. You know, when you're a bodybuilding stage, they don't ask you to do a bent row. They just ask you to flex your back. And there's like yeah. 10 different exercises that are almost as good. Yeah. Uh, as he, but for powerlifting or for weightlifting, this works the same way. The competition exercises are themselves the best way to get stronger. And then they have close derivatives that maybe are more sustainable, maybe target one part of the body versus another. Like, for example, like your low bar squat is great, but your quads are your limiting factor. Well, you switch nothing except you put the high, uh, squat into a high bar position. Now that's more quads, a little bit less of everything else, but it's still super specific. Still, you can lose a lot of tension. The technique transfers a lot. You work on your quads, you get them stronger, and you go back to low bar squatting, and after a while you hit huge low bar PRs because you sort of fixed your weak link. Does that make sense? But if someone was to say, well, it doesn't matter what exercises are good, 
they're going to be especially wrong for powerlifting because imagine someone this powerlifting, but the only quadriceps uh, stuff they do in addition to it's very low volume of our squatting is leg extensions. Can you imagine a powerlifting leg extension? They're coming to squat the world next year. Like, what the fuck are you <laughs> talking about? No, you're not. So we know when you're looking for assistance exercises for strength building or hypertrophy work for powerlifting, that transfer of training specificity effect is going to be key. So like if you want a bigger bench press, it's going to be different pressing variations, relatively heavy, stable ones, right? Yeah. You're not going to be doing the sort of one arm cable flies. You're going to be doing heavy dumbbell, heavy barbell work. For deadlift, it's various pulling um, uh, exercises, stiff legged deadlifts, high, bar, high, low bar, good mornings. For squatting, a lot of times it's just more squatting. Sometimes it's high bar squatting. Sometimes it's front squatting. Sometimes it's leg pressing and hack squatting and it's very not very often lunges or one leg work or leg extensions, so on and so forth. So yeah. that is a really hell of a fucking tirade of answer, but hopefully it's <laughs> one that made sense. Yeah, absolutely. The a couple of key points that I took from there sort of, um, you said obviously is based on the individual. I think sometimes, um, and you, you touched on it a little bit when you mentioned about hypertrophy and as well for, for, for powerlifting uh, or strength training, that people think that there's certain exercises that they have to do uh, or people are recommend, I think you mentioned there about, oh, have you done a, a sissy squat before? Um, well, yeah, I have, but it's not really for me. Whereas, you know, people will get into a habit of going into the gym and being like, right, I'm going to use this machine, this machine, and then I'm going to go and, go and do that where um, that, that isn't the case. And, you know, why I wanted to chat to you about it is that there is, um, the, a lot of questions that, I, that I'll ask my clients is how does that feel? Where are you feeling that? And oh for, my God, so important. Yeah. If they're, if they're not feeling it, if they're not feeling it where they're supposed to feel it, right, then we're not going to waste our time doing that, doing that exercise. Let's find something that, um, they're going to be able to feel as though they're worked and they can actually feel the, feel the muscle working as opposed to just, well, yeah, wasting time doing an exercise that isn't going to, that isn't going to get them anywhere. Um, and, you know, interesting that you're saying that different, uh, depending on what you need, um, the exercises will different, you know, depending on fatigue and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Because I think people think that, um, I think sometimes people's goals, they forget about it a little bit. They feel like they need to tick every single box, especially for hypertrophy, because they, they think that they need to do as many exercises as they can. Whereas actually, let's have a look at, you know, what, what, uh, what exercises are going to get the best um, for what your goals yep. your goals are? In the context of limited fatigue and time resources, because that's always limited to some extent. Yeah. I'll give you a, a pretty uh, uh, interesting example. Interesting. Let me give you a sort of very uh, relevant salient example of, of the application of this kind of theory. So somebody could be coming from the hardcore, maybe CrossFit, maybe powerlifting, maybe starting strength kind of space. And they could see a bodybuilder doing a one-arm cable rear delt fly and say, fucking pussy, he should be doing fucking barbell rows and face pulls with a barbell and hand cleans and he'll get his rear delts really big. Like, uh, okay. Are those all very stimulative exercises? Yes. But the bodybuilder has eight other training sessions that week where he does a bunch of those kinds of exercises for other body parts. He's already done bent rows for his back. He's done deadlifts for his back. He's done squats for his legs and leg presses and lunges. His systemic fatigue, if it was a glass that was this tall, is right filled to almost the brim. <laughs> so he's going to want exercises for his delts that are way more targeted and exact way less uh, fatigue. For example, the question here is, if you are doing face pulls, should you do them with a barbell bent over or should you do them with a barbell but leaning on a 45 degree bench? Depends on what your MRV is for your back musculature and your spinal rectures and hamstrings and glutes, how close you are to it and whether or not you want to chip away at that because it could be part of your training, but it could also just be pissing away extra fatigue. Yeah. So if you're doing a hamstring and lower back uh, priority cycle, you could take your face pulls and put them on a fucking 45 degree bench and be lazy so you can save your hamstrings and back for when they need to be trained like a day later. But if you are, uh, you know, in the context of like, you know, you've never been limited by your hamstrings or lower back and they're really strong uh, and you always respond to a bunch of volume, you know, stop being a fucking wuss and bend over and fucking do face pulls because you got to use just great more extra work that you're going to be able to benefit from. So on the one hand, there's that critique. On the other hand, there is taking that same exercise of uh, one arm cable dildo flies and uh, 
you uh, look at a personal trainer uh, in some major city like I don't know, like London personal training community, um, and they go. You watch the trainer train like a forty-five-year-old career woman who only trains twice a week, wants to just be lean and muscular and felt, uh, you know, and look good and feel good. He's got 45 minutes with her twice a week and he spends five minutes teaching her the technique, warming her up and having her do one arm at a time, uh, you know, one arm uh, rear delt flies. I mean, holy stimulus to time ratio. Christ, is that a terrible fucking idea? <laughs> that woman can drop that personal trainer and either hire another one or just join a CrossFit box, get smashed into a wall for 45 minutes twice a week, <laughs> For her time, she's going to get way more fractional synthetic rate elevation and muscle growth, way more calorie burning, way more health benefits, way more fun, but might I add. Um, and it's all a huge victory. So using these three separate indices and ways of thinking about things, you start to realize that, you know, like it's not rocket science, but it is specific to the individual and their demands. So the same rear delt exercise can be absolutely what the doctor ordered for a professional bodybuilder. And just the worst idea ever for a regular person who wants to get in shape. So now coming back to your original question of are there better and worse exercises, the answer is it depends on the context. And it's not, a, yeah. not an answer that's like, you know, like the stupid, like sometimes people are just lazy and they're like, well, it depends. Everything depends. Like, it depends on what, motherfucker? <laughs> like, get insight, not it depends. It yeah. depends on things that are predictable and measurable and you can do a good job with them, like the various three ratios. But uh, there's, you know, when someone says, is that a good exercise? Um, the answer to that can really be quite varied. And in, in the context, there's definitely an answer to that. Uh, but in without context, there sometimes isn't. Now, before I, I, I you continue other questions, I will say that some exercises uh, get really low scores on all three of those indices, and then they're just bad. Uh, yeah. I will pick on the quintessential uh, exercise, the BOSU ball squat, <laughs> right? So what is the raw stimulus magnitude of squatting on a BOSU ball? Well, shit, because you can't produce hardly any force because you're busy stabilizing yourself, um, trying not to get killed. What is the stimulus to fatigue ratio? Well, good news, it doesn't fatigue you a whole lot, but it doesn't stimulate you hardly at all. So the stimulus to fatigue ratio is at best, like, just not very good. And, but best, just average, and at, at worst, not very good at all. Yeah. And then the, what's the stimulus to time ratio? Well, this, the raw stimulus is so awful, and it takes so much goddamn time to do the thing. Uh, you got to set the shit up and, ooh, 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 and, yeah. ooh and give all kinds of cues um, that, you know, a CrossFitter could have done like 20 thrusters by the time you got on the fucking ball. <laughs> and um, so it's also shit. So like when we like people say, people like to do this, I don't know, call it, I'll call it sophistry, but they like to do this um, kind of committing type two error at large or just basically saying like, there's no differences. Like everything has a place, man. Uh, they'll say like, you know, there's no such thing as a good or bad exercise. Just it's all tools in the toolbox. Like, okay, yeah, let's, well, let's explore that toolbox analogy. And if you had a toolbox, you'd be like, sometimes a hammer is good, sometimes a screwdriver is good, but when is like a, like a two-sided dildo good? Oh, I'll make this better. It's a two-sided dildo that collapses anytime you try to stick it into a hole. It's not a big dildo. And then you're like, well, it's just a tool in the toolbox. It's, like, it's a fucking tool for what? It's fucking such an awful tool. Or like anytime we have like a nanomaterials part of thing that looks like a solid, but anytime you try to pick it up, it turns into a liquid and goops out. You're like, okay, I don't need this. Nobody needs yeah. this. It's like an apple core. He was just throwing an apple core into someone's toolbox. And they're like, why is that there? Like just fucking another tool in the toolbox. And some exercises are the equivalent of a fucking useless dildo apple core or nanomaterial thing. And, and the people will defend them just because they're trying to be nice or they're trying to be inclusive or they're just any better. And they're like, well, it's tool in toolbox. So some tools, are awesome and some tools fucking suck <laughs> and a lot of tools are just somewhere in between so totally yeah but some exercises just blow so if you want to know which ones blow try to figure out even just in your head thinking about it it is first first thing does this exercise present a robust stimulus am i going to work working hard and feeling it if that if not or bad off to a bad start but some exercises can make up for that based on how specific the stimulus is and on their very low fatigue. So like a rear delt single cable fly, not bad because it hits exactly the rear delt. And for the rear delt, the stimulus is decent, yeah. not great. But the fatigue is tiny because it you know, barely hits your joints. It's not a lot of weight. You don't even have to do it upright. So all of a sudden, the stimulus to fatigue ratio at the very least is like at least decent. So it's defensible in some cases, right? So you can ask the question, of, first of all, is, is the stimulus robust? If the answer to that is no, you're already off to a real bad start. 
Next, is the fatigue uh, high? If the fatigue is high and the stimulus isn't robust, the exercise is a dud. Yeah. The last bastion of hope is how long does the exercise take slash how much work can I do in it in a constrained amount of time? For example, um, and this is an interesting uh, comment on real world stuff. If you're training a bodybuilder and he's really strong but he's time constrained, do you have him deadlift? No, because it takes a long time to warm up for the deadlift. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you have a real quick back workout and you're a bodybuilder, you get on the Smith machine and you do warm up super quick and you Smith machine barbell rows, super set into lat pull downs. You put your straps on so your grip's not a thing and within 10 or 15 minutes, your lats can be blown up. You're out, you're good, right? It's not a sustainable way to train, but at least you got something going. So, you know, the, the efficiency ratio is a thing and you have to determine, okay, is this exercise at least an economical, efficient way to be in the gym? And if not, it has maybe some other benefits. But if, if the stimulus sucks, if the fatigue is high, uh, or if the exercise takes a long time to do, um, you're into some shit. And, and I, I will say that the, almost the quintessential, not example of this, but a theoretical category of such exercises are exercises in the gym that are not heavily loaded and or not taken to failure or not safe to take to failure with good technique. Exercises that produce a lot of fatigue, especially joint uh, fatigue um, and possibly frustration and possibly central fatigue and exercises that at the same time take a lot of skill to learn um, and are, uh, you know, it require constant supervision and just take a while to get into and actually do properly. Um, hilariously enough, um, the uh, Turkish getup, do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is, checks almost every single one of those boxes. So if you, how stimulative is it? Stimulative to what? You train to be a waiter that fell down but kept the fucking, you know, the, the plate up? No, it's not stimulative to hardly anything. Uh, what about fatigue? Well, funny enough, like, it puts your shoulder in an interesting position. I mean, it's not injurious, but like, gee, you know, like, that's a whole lot of contorting you got to do. And to a lot of people, it's kind of like, it's a lot of weight to hold overhead. So yeah. shoulder joints maybe not the greatest thing in the world. And then how much time does it take relative to its stimulus? Fucking forever? You got to teach someone how to do it? They're like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So like, if you're a personal training client, and you want fitness for two or three sessions a week, gee, man, you know, your trainer is having you do some kind of fucking balance shit or gymnastics bullshit or some aerobics or some fucking Turkish get-ups. You're getting fucked in the ass. But you're getting ripped off. Yeah. And most people don't know that, right? And because most people, the way they judge exercise effect, is it perceptually challenging in any way? Like just being bad at something and being humbled by it, most regular people think like, oh, it's got to be effective. Like, oh, it's trick get up It was so hard. Like, yeah, you know, like hitting your dick with a hammer is hard too, but it's not exactly going to get you jacked. Sorry if I keep making these obscene analogies. <laughs> Last high rated episode you'll ever have. But um, <laughs> I'm finding it funny. I'm just, yeah, it's, uh, I'm, I'm liking the analogies. <laughs> there you go. So, like, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that's hard. Like, you know, if you decided to go visit Germany and try to speak German for the first time ever and you sucked at it, like, that would be really difficult. Could we say that's going to, like, increase your intellectual development and sports science? Probably not, man. It's just it's unrelated. So a lot of people think what's a good exercise is just hard. And it's really just that's not the case. Like, yes, difficulty is a part if raw stimulus magnitude, but it's got to be a specific kind of difficulty, not just feeling like you suck at something. So for regular folks... Do you feel the exercise in the target muscle? Does the exercise, is it physically difficult to execute? Does it make your whole body tired? Does it make you breathe heavy? So if you're a regular person at fitness, those kinds of things, yeah, that, that's going to go a certain distance. But if it just feels wobbly or weird, you're probably just not getting a whole lot out of it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why CrossFit is so much better than a bunch of regular fitness training because, you know, like you're, they're going to fuck you up and you're going to get in better shape. Uh, doing Turkish get-ups, uh, learning that for 30 minutes and sucking at it. You're not really training for fitness. So you're training to do a Turkish get-up, which I guess is a cool par parlor trick. Yeah. Um, yeah, on a, on a side note, I will be nicking, I will be stealing some of your analogies there. Um, Perfect. Well, they're, not, they're not owned by me, so they're all for all public, our public but, use. But through, through all of that, um, you've covered quite a lot of questions, really, that I had in, in follow-up to that. Um, you know, an answer is, I've used the answer, you know, it, it depends because it's a, it's a short, easier answer. However, what I do like is when, when clients or other coaches ask on what, 
and then there's actually things th- things behind it. Um, you know, one of the ex- one of the questions I was going to ask about um, bad exercises and that sort of stuff. And I have heard it before. You know, it is a different it is a different toolkit uh, or a different tool in the in the toolbox. But there's got to be a purpose behind it. It's got to have some sort of an effect. And yes. a key thing from there that you know you know it's a hundred percent. You know why I wanted to chat to you about this topic is that. Um, it's got to be relevant to what, what you are, you know, not everyone is um, professional body, professional bodybuilders. It might just be that they they've got, um, they've got three hours during the week when they can train because they're a, a high end business man or woman uh, and they need to get in and, you know, get, get the work done and get the most bang for the book. Um, CrossFit, as much as that, you know, sometimes gets a little bit of a bad reputation for injuries and whatnot and that sort of stuff. That's getting better too. Yeah, you know, the, there are some things that they do that they do really good, and in terms of actual exercises and the work that you're gonna get get out of it, no one ever goes to a CrossFit class and walks out and thinks, could have done a little bit, could have done a little bit more there. And, and yeah. nor do they walk out of it thinking like, well, that was really challenging stuff in a weird way, but it really wasn't a good workout. Like, yeah. they they get out worked out. Like I've literally seen people like I, you can tell I've, I was a personal trainer for a while and I got really, really sullied by the profession. But, um, you know, I would see people walk out of personal training sessions without a drip of sweat on their body. And they felt like they're like, oh, that was tough today. And they're high five their trainer like, woman, you have never seen tough. You wouldn't survive it at this rate if you keep up with this trainer. So it's, it's, it's important to, you know, to make that distinction. And it's honestly a travesty a lot of times when personal trainers uh, – offer services to people yeah. to get them in shape. And what they're really doing is like just eluding them with parlor yeah. tricks that make these people feel like they're doing something and then they just don't get results. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it comes back to what you were, what you were chatting before about um, it, it comes down to their, to their goal. You know, if it's uh, someone who just wants to, who is overweight uh, and wants to, wants to drop down a, drop down a couple of sizes, doing those, you know, cable reverse flies might be good, you know, when they're wanting to, when they've dropped the weight and they're wanting to look shredded, look really good and they can train for like, you know, five, six times a week. But to start off with, yeah, you know, that's not going to be relevant, relevant to their goals. Um, so yeah, I can uh, I can tick off a couple of them questions there because yeah, yeah, answer them without uh, without me mentioning them. Um, on the moving along from obviously you chatted about uh, the exercise selection and and stimulus, um, you know, and uh, working towards the goals. Another um, element that people have to consider when they are working towards you know building muscle or, or getting stronger is they've got to make sure that their nutrition. Um, is 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 in order you know that does play a big role and uh, there's quite a lot of questions of or quite a lot of people will mention about what supplements they're using you know oh, I'm gonna have this uh, supplement for my breakfast or uh, I'm gonna take this I'm gonna take that um, and sometimes it's a little bit right well where's your where's your actual food that you're that, that you're eating you know you, what how many supplements are you taking so I suppose the question from that is um, can you can you take too much supplements and how can um what's the ratio of supplements compared to sort of real food because i think sometimes people think oh well i'm going to take all the supplements um and that's going to get me to my goals faster as opposed to you know you still need food to 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 live on for sure so a couple of things first of all uh you can take too many supplements in a sheer medical sense but it depends on the supplements fat soluble vitamins vitamins a d e and k actually store up in your tissues over time so if you're overdosing on them chronically you, you end up getting really sick um, you really can't overdose too much on water soluble vitamins, but, uh, you can sure piss away a whole lot of money. Um, cause after just a few, you know, a uh, few of those, your, your body can only use so many and there's no, uh, dose dependent response for supplements. Like it's not like the more vitamin C you take, the better, like nah, after a certain point, it just does nothing at all. There's yeah. not much of a curve there. So you can't take too many supplements just on those grounds. You can't take too many whey protein supplements or protein supplements of any kind, really, because if you have healthy kidneys, you can have as much protein as you could possibly eat and you just do just fine. Again, it is a question of what you use with your money and whether or not you can enjoy life more with regular food. Yeah. So, which comes to the next point. Uh, the total magnitude of effect of supplements, uh, something we've done quite a bit of insight into at Renaissance, who wrote uh, Renaissance Diet and now the Renaissance Diet 2.0. But we did a whole lot of reviewing the literature and we found that the effect magnitudes for how much supplements make a difference are so small that most studies can't even detect them. <laughs> so uh, in the grand scheme of things, you have to compare your whole diet 
how many calories a day you eat, how many macros of which kinds you eat, meal timing, actual food choices you make. Supplements come in at maybe 5% of the total difference between individuals. Let me put this to you another way. If you get an individual that's done one 12-week diet with those randomly assorted, random calories, random macros, and the week, uh, and then the same individual does another 12-week diet, but we really sh get his supplements straight, yeah. he can expect to get 5% better results okay, with the 12-week diet. I don't mean like 5% body fat. Yeah. I mean if you lose 10% body fat in one diet, which would be unbelievable, if you use the best supplements in the world, you would lose. You would uh, gain only lose another additional half a percent body fat, getting all your supplements completely. It would just like that's just really that's just really not great. Now, yeah. where is the benefit over the long term? Years and years of training, taking the right supplements can give you five percent more gains or five percent more fat loss. That's a cool thing. It's good, you know, like in your bodybuilding stage, five percent counts for a whole lot of stuff. Uh, creatine, for example, can enhance muscle growth to a small extent and can visually, by adding intramuscular water, make you bigger on stage, uh, maybe by two or three kilos. And look, if you're the same leanness and you're two or three kilos bigger in your muscles, you just moved up a placing or two in your bodybuilding, right? So it's definitely a thing. If you put five kilos on your powerlifting total more in a year because you use creatine, which is reasonable expectation, not the end of the world, not the, the greatest thing ever, but five kilos will win you your weight class. You know, you'll, you'll qualify for British championships at five kilos and five less you won't. So yeah. it's a thing. This is just a very small thing. And then let's talk about how powerful diet is. Well, your calorie balance determines probably 50% of that whole equation. Macronutrients, maybe 30%. Nutrient timing, 10%. These are megalith monsters of effect. So if someone asks like, hey, like, this is a typical question you get from people. I'm sure you get this uh, a ton. People who you know for a fact know dick about their diets and precisely nothing will ask you like, hey, so like um, what kind of protein do you take? You're just like, <laughs> now let's get intellectual for a second. Let's, let's, let's uh, just uh, do some mental masturbation. In a technical sense, they're not asking you how effective protein powder is because the answer to that question by itself is, Roughly 1%, <laughs> okay? What they're asking you is if you line up all of the different kinds of protein powders and the average yield is 1%, like this, we got a bar, measures 1% here, and we got all the different protein powders, what's the difference between them? <laughs> I mean, holy shit, let's say it's a big difference and it's 10% between them. That's one-tenth of 1%. <laughs> 1 that literally, I can't make this up. So if someone's like, hey, do you use like, Synthesis from BSN or whatever from Optimum Nutrition, you just, just do like the slow eye bat where you're just like, <laughs> for the love of God, it doesn't matter but for one tenth of one, something really small. Now, now, I will say, if you're competing on the Olympia stage, your highest level of competition, or if you are putting together the powerlifting meet of your life, you got to qualify for some shit. Is it good to take protein powder that sits well with you and it doesn't give you GI distress? Or even spend a little bit more money to get the most pure protein powder that works. The highest levels of amino acids and the best absorptions. Sure, maybe. Because yeah. you just don't want to leave anything on the table. But anyone short of a perfectionist with really exotic goals, if they are to say that they're wasting their time in asking that question, is uh, you could ask them a similar question. This is a similar question, a question of similar magnitude. Um, how many, how many steps did you take to work exactly today? you would be like, what? Why would I count that? You're like, mm -hmm. well, that's about as much difference as it makes to anything. Like if you take five less steps, you'll burn that fewer calories. Like that's just what it amounts to. So it ends up being that the question of what kind of protein powder do you take or something like that is probably just one of the most ridiculous questions ever versus, hey, how many calories do you think I should be eating per day or how much food? Put it another way, how fast should I try to lose weight? Now that is a question of, essential importance you try to lose a kilo a week you might burn out the diet quit and gain all your fat back you lose half a kilo a week you're going to get really great results you, you try to lose it a tenth of a kilo a week you're just going to be wasting your time these are real real big differences so without putting too fine a point on it to answer your original question of how big of a difference is there diet versus supplements the world right <laughs> And where differences between diets really amount to something, differences between supplements amount almost to nothing. 
Yeah. I will say, you know, taking creatine is probably a good idea for most people. Whey protein with workouts, some glycemic carbohydrates with workouts, casein protein at night or just some kind of milk protein. Um, fish oils might have a small benefit, maybe not sure. And just in case, I think most regular people should probably take a multivitamin every day, just like a candy, gummy, chewy one. Because they're cheap. It's, they're super cheap, but it just kind of rounds out all your intake to make sure you're not deficient to some extent. And uh, that's about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it was a good point. You know, I'm glad you mentioned about the about the protein, uh, the protein powder, um, because everything gets sort of, um, you know, we we chatted a little bit about you know the social media at the start of this chat about social media and following and that sort of stuff. And um, I think social media is for all the things that are good. There are some negative things on that, and I think it is you know when people are looking and you know take this protein, it's got 10% more protein. It'll help. 10% more gains. Whereas really, you know, when you look into it, there's no difference between that product compared, compared to others. And for, you know, again, when we spoke about exercise selection, depending on what your goals are, do you really need it? Yes, you can, you can take it. Um, but then some people will, um, there was, uh, I did a session a, a couple of weeks ago and, uh, the, the, one of the clients had recently just started training and, um, for three days, three days worth of food, all he had was was just shakes. I said, "Oh, I said, what what what's the reasoning behind behind this? Are you not hungry? Because compared to the food that I would eat, I was like, I'm looking at this and I am I'm hungry. And his his whole reasoning was he got sold as a meal replacement. And my idea was like, I wouldn't I wouldn't go I wouldn't go to a restaurant, you know, to a steak restaurant, and they give me a shake. And there you go, there's your there's your steak dinner." No, I want my steak. You know, I want, I, I want, I want actual food. If not, restaurants would just go out, out go out of business. Um, sure. Started talking. A um, couple of weeks down the line, he started eating food. Oh my god! Like it's really, really. It's, you know, I'm, I'm feeling, <laughs> food is good. <laughs> I'm feeling, I'm feeling happier. I don't feel as miserable. Um, and then there was only one day where where he had it, where he had it. And uh, I said, "Why did you have it that day compared to you know now that you're eating now that you're eating real food? Obviously, you're feeling better. You've gotten up more energy. Obviously, performance is happening. You're putting muscle on. Everything's good. Why did you have it that day?" He said, um, "I was in a meeting all day. Uh, I didn't have time to grab some food. Um, I'd ate all the food that I'd prepped, so I had that. And I went, can you understand now? While wow, that's a meal replacement." It's a meal yep. supplement. It's yep. for that when you know the, you, it's on your last resort, and you and you can do it. Whereas, um, yeah, I find it, I find it quite square, scary sometimes. Really, when people are just um, put so so much of a bigger emphasis on uh, on supplements compared to um, you know having uh, having real food, if you like. Yeah, if you take them for convenience, you can take them and they're safe and it's totally fine. There's nothing going wrong with that. But if you take them for any other reason than convenience, uh, except for like a tiny bit of optimality here and there for very specific populations, you're just wasting your time and you're needlessly hampering yourself. Um, while we're on the subject, you know, one of the biggest keys to uh, success in training as a, as a client is developing habits and sustainable practices that will take you for the rest of your, for this journey, which ends when you die, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, less morbid way to put that. In, so, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> all fitness ends in death. Um, so, you know, if you, if your idea of a fitness intervention is to drink like gross shakes that you buy from a multi-level marketing company, they must sit you down and be like, listen, you know, like, um, what's your plan here? And they're like, well, I'm going to lose weight with these shakes. Like, okay. And then what? Like, then I'm just going to go back to my normal diet. Like, okay. what made you fat originally? And they're like, my normal diet. Like, mm hmm and you don't think it'll make you fat this time? They're like, okay, yeah, probably will. All right. Yeah. So why don't we get you lean in the same way that fundamentally is going to keep you lean, which is learning how to eat whole healthy foods that you can enjoy and be part of a good diet. And, and you don't need to keep buying these dumbass shakes. And a lot of times people will be like, oh, that's a fucking good point. But you know, most people don't have access to that sort of information right off the tip of their fingers. So when they, they scroll on Instagram and their favorite influencer has a fucking you know, dildo shake and they're like, I want a fucking dildo shake. I want to drink it and I want to be lean. And that's how, apparently that's how it's done. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, you know, not just that, it's not just that, okay, you can have the supplements and you can have the shakes and it's not a downside, which is not. It's that there is a little bit of a downside there with lacking the habit formation that's going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you learn how to eat proper solid food with a mix of shakes as needed, like you said, a protein bar in your backpack just in case, then you're good to go. Um, but if you just 
think there's some kind of magic. And here's like, I'd like, I would like to address this um, for sure. People think that there is some sort of mysterious plus side, like an X factor, like a magic thing to various products, especially supplements. And, and they think there's no way that these things are just food, but put simply and just dilute it down so that I could just drink it really fast. Like, no, that's all it is. People just don't seem to be by default think that's the case. A part of that is advertising, but a big part of it's people are pretty, pretty credulous and they, they want to believe, right? Like if, if someone, you know, like if a superhero did this and energy came out of his hands and then like blew up a truck and then he looked at you and he had a ring and the ring blinged and then he like teleported away and someone asked you like, Hey, what did you see? How did that guy do it? You're like, yo, he had a magic fucking ring and he blew up the truck with his ring. It's like the ring could have just blinged because the light hit it and it was just a ring he wears because he liked it. He was from his childhood on planet, whatever the fuck where he grew up. Yeah. And then you would interview him and he'd be like, Oh, the ring, oh, it's, it's, it's a sentimental piece. I actually shoot fire like right out of my hands. So you're like, ah, all right. But like that bling, there's something to it. There's gotta be something. There's gotta be some of that ring. Supplements are the same way where people are like, man, look at that shiny red bag or, or that little, little vials of like an amino acids. Yeah. It's, it's got to be something there, something extra, something special. Yeah. And when you realize that they're just a, another tool in the toolbox is not that great of a tool, usually just a very limited one, uh, you know, it's a, it turns into something like a staple remover in the construction worker's toolbox. Like, that's eh, cool for removing staples. Um, doesn't do a whole lot else. Yeah. If you don't have staples to remove, it's pretty useless. If you do have staples to remove, it's nice, but your hammer can do that too. And so it's, it's uh, one of those things that, that context and that we like to promote at RP especially is a really like a lack of magical thinking altogether. If you're looking for the edge, stop, stop. If you're looking for effective strategies that will require work and building habits, but really, really have you in successful place over the long term, there's tons of that. But that shit doesn't come in a red bag. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, yeah, getting distracted by something, something shiny, you know, when they, when they, uh, uh, advertise it and it's like gold and yeah, flashy and um, people can get, can get caught up in it. But, um, yeah, it'd be interesting if it, you know, was just in a, uh, in a plain brown bag, whether, um, people would still, you know, jump on the, jump on the bandwagon, uh, if you like, which, you know, would be, would be interesting. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mentioned there about um, you know food throughout the uh, day of training. Um, obviously, I mentioned there about you know a client that I worked with uh, working through um, you know basically just living off shakes for for a couple of weeks um, and going full circle as we mentioned about the uh, the RP app. Mm-hmm. How does uh, how do you go about uh, changing calories and changing food? on um on training days compared to compared to rest days so when people are chatting and obviously you mentioned there about if people are um uh, going on one diet and then i'm going to go back to what 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 i was doing before um there has to be a little bit more of a routine when it comes to it come to a training plan because what they've been doing before isn't working because some people have been training but they're not doing anything that can be down to um you know the exercise selection that we've mentioned or potentially they've not changed their their eating habits so what mm-hmm. sort of the process and reasoning behind changing calories on the uh, type of day that you'll be either training or resting if that makes so sense. yeah yeah so a couple of things first of all the average weekly even monthly calorie deficit for fat loss and surplus for muscle gain is what matters so by definition all of the alterations of weekly calorie load or daily calorie load are very secondary. Not to say that they're not uh, insignificant, but there's just not going to matter that much. Um, there are a couple of reasons to alter calories day in, day out. Uh, some of them are a little bit less convincing and possibly not as likely, like some kind of benefit to the alteration itself that because the body gets sometimes high calories, sometimes low, it goes through this process of sort of not really thinking it's ever in a diet. Um, with various hormonal and neurological effects, uh, there might be something to that. That's, uh, uh, that's the story. The jury's still out on that. Um, there are some definite benefits. For example, is it important that you're able to train hard? Yes. What is the best way to train hard? Eating plenty of food in the several hours before you train hard. Uh, and on a hypocaloric diet, completely not for debate. You know, like you get some food in you, you go guy all kinds of, you know, you're pissing, pissing fire at that point. So, um, the next question is, are you able to have that much energy if you don't eat a lot of food? No. Okay. 
So should you have at least a pretty a little bit more food pre-training? Yes, probably. So it automatically, like, all other things being equal, you're going to have more calories on a training day because all other things being equal, you're going to add some food in the pre-workout. Yeah. Next question. So that's for sure the case. Next question is, do you have to add more food in to recover after training? Well, your muscles are more sensitive to glucose after training and uptake. They're more sensitive to anabolism. They have a heightened level of catabolism. So the workout window is largely a myth. Nothing super magical happens. But the four to six hours after training is probably an opportunity to do a little bit more refueling than usual and a little bit more muscle building, uh, the, the beginnings of muscle building, putting that into motion and preventing some muscle loss as well. And also, you're going to be very hungry then anyway. You're hungriest. So you might as well eat more food then because that checks all those boxes. So all of a sudden, your pre-workout and post-workout, you're eating more food. Um, and that automatically biases oh, calories away from non-training days into uh, days in which you train. And people ask, you know, so, so what's the advantage of eating fewer calories on non-training days? Well, there is no advantage. Ideally, we would eat more calories on all the days. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of your muscle growth, because it's a process that takes you know several hours and days to elevate and several hours to days to come back down, largely, not, not exclusively, but a lot of it happens on non-training days, especially if you train four or five times a week, and every non-training day is really just an opportunity to grow more muscle. So it's not like you know if you eat very few calories there, like you're winning somehow. Like well, relatively speaking, you're losing. But if you compare that to the advantage you get for eating calories on the training days, then you you there's a bit of a difference there. So um, uh, I would say at a fat loss diet, it's probably a pretty decent idea to eat a little bit more food pre-training, post-training, and thus a little less food on the off days, and also times out very far outside the workout. Um, on a muscle gain or maintenance plan, if you can satisfy your pre-training and post-training requirements within the context of the normal amount of food, which you probably can, you just don't need to pull food out of the other days, so you can eat actually a relatively similar amount of food and not really pay any price for it. And, and just to put this in context, um, you know, how big of a difference is there? The answer is just not that big. Um, but, uh, you know, we're talking about like a 60-40 difference not a three to one difference in calories. Yeah. Um, there are exceptions to that. Uh, if you train two hours per session twice a day, the energy demand pre and post training is going to be massive. And you're going to eat a lot of food. And then the concomitant number of calories you have to remove from your off days uh, in order to balance that out, if you're at a certain deficit, is going to be much higher. So the ratio is going to be much more tilted. So it's interesting. People will do like a 45-minute workout and be like, yeah, I eat 4,000 calories today. I'm way off days to eat 2,000. You're like, good God, you're barely doing anything. Um, on the RP Diet app, if you categorize one of your workouts, you just train once a day and you categorize it as what's called a light workout, which is like you know, 45 minutes of like just like a little bit of bullshit here and there, warming up, riding the bike. Um, people have noticed that sometimes, depending on your various uh, biometric factors, that it actually it gives you less food on your light day than it does on an off day, especially if the off day is longer in time because we give you more food if you're awake for longer. And they're like, how is this possible? Like, well, this, you know, you didn't just really do all that much. I don't know what to tell you. Like, sorry. Um, but, you know, if you're training twice a day for two hours at a time, yeah, you need a whole lot more food. And it's not like there's anything magical about eating that much food or restricting. It's just you need energy pre-recovery post, and that's going to take food away from one place or another. If you don't do that at all, are you still uh, going to get great, great results? Yeah, for sure. But you probably get just slightly better results. Um, the way you figure that out is you use athletes that are really pushing themselves to the limit, and then you see what they do. So, for example, like um, you take an elite cyclist, right, who rides for four to six hours a day, and you say, hey, could you, like, do intermittent fasting and then go on your cycle ride? You're going to be like, what the fuck is wrong? What? No, I will die on the road. And then you could say, well, what about on your off days? Do you eat as much as on your training days? And they would be like, I would just be vomiting blood if I tried that. Like outside of liquids on the bike, I can't get a thousand grams of carbs on my off day. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes they don't eat much as much on their off days or lighter days because they physically can't have that much food throughput. Um, but when you're training like crazy, you can eat a lot of food uh, and, and your everything gets pulled right through. So so that would basically be my uh, my view of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes people, um, it always how you word how you worded it there um, is quite a. It was a good explanation of where people can sometimes go wrong. Of what what you've said there, sometimes people will um, 
not eat as much or they'll um, try and borrow calories, if you like, and put it onto their training days. And then all of a sudden, like, they look at the calories that they've got for the rest days and it's like, oh, I can have some ham or some mm. tuna and, that, and that's about it. Whereas actually, you know, a big thing that you, that you mentioned there is recovery. That's how you're going to, you know, build, build muscle, repair, um, and, you know, uh, the, you know, that word there, re- recover for the, for the next session, not just, um, it's not all about just the, just the training days. Obviously you said there as well that you might have like a monthly target if you like, or a week, a weekly target. Um, I think sometimes forget about that. Some people forget about the, the bigger picture, um, of it as opposed to just like, all right, today I've got squats, so I'm just going to smash a lot, smash a lot of calories, which isn't bad. But you've also got to take into account, you know, the other things uh, on the other days, like obviously you've mentioned, you've mentioned there. Yeah, you brought up a really good point. Like sometimes for adherence, you don't want to eat too little on the off days or lighter days because it'll just drive you insane from hunger. When uh, we have a variety of anti-hunger strategies that we've developed at RP, and one of them is if you're training really hard, if you're really deep in a deficit and you have to get lean and performance is secondary to you getting lean, on the higher training days, you can actually eat less food than you do on the lower training days which is completely insane. thing is when you're, when you're training super hard multiple times a day, you're constantly, in, you're always in sympathetic nervous system elevation. You're never really that hungry. Like you're fight or flight. Like someone's running away from a dinosaur and you get a reporter on a car to pull up to them and be like, are you currently hungry? <laughs> They'd be like, no, I'm trying to not die. You know, like you, you don't see people in horror movies eating food much because, you know, there's just not something on your mind, you know, like you run by a grocery store, zombies you are like, oh wait, those are crisps that I really like. <laughs> <laughs> it's nonsense. But like, um, you know, when you're on your off day and you're recovering and so on and so forth, the hunger really comes back like crazy. So sometimes, like in my case, when I do really, really deep cuts, sometimes I'll eat the same amount of food on a training day as on an off day or or a lighter training day, sometimes even less uh, to take into account those factors. And you definitely bring up another good point. Like you don't want to alter your lifestyle completely and live two different days. Like we got my off days and my on days and nothing like, like the core protein and veggies and stuff should fundamentally be there all the time. Shouldn't be doing like, 500 calories on one day and 3,000. You see, you can't. But if it's really hurting your lifestyle and hurting your consistency and it's driving you nuts from hunger, it's a bad idea. It's probably not, yeah. not a good thing. Yeah. Um, quite a lot of topics uh, covered there. Um, I really enjoyed the first time that I, that I chatted with you. Um, I, I feel quite lucky that, you know, I've been managed to um, have you on the podcast twice. Uh, like say, you're, you're a coach that I followed for quite a while, following the content you put out there. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, to finish off, for everyone listening, what would be your um, take-home points or words of wisdom um, from everything that we've chatted about today? Yeah, think. For the love of God, think. Uh, and just uh, if things make some sense and you can derive some sort of commonalities, then uh, work hard at the basics and eventually your shit can get really complicated. But if you're trying to replace all your food with shakes or find the magical exercise, you're probably not going to be as successful as if you find some exercises that work pretty well, figure out the ones slowly over time that work better, stick to a good diet, tweak it to your liking and to your ability to execute it. And then all of a sudden, a couple of years later, you'll be in real good shape. And uh, another generation of people will ask you how you got into great shape and assume it took you three weeks instead of three years and you'll have to steer them straight and continue the passing on the wisdom. Yeah. So that's, that's that. Awesome. Um, so and as again, uh, for everyone listening who uh, might want to uh, get involved with the RP uh, app or uh, you know get involved in the coaching or see the content that yourself and Renaissance Periodization put out there, uh, where, can people, where can people find you? Yeah, probably one of the best places is Instagram, at RP Strength and Renaissance Periodization, which probably nobody can spell. I sure as hell can't. Uh, on uh, the regular internet, uh, RP Dr. Mike on Instagram, Mike Isretal on Facebook. You can find my stuff there. And uh, on iTunes, in the iTunes store and the Google Play store, RP Diet is the app. And uh, it's uh, free for two weeks, for the first two weeks. And then after that, it's only... $15 a month, which is probably like 10 or 11 pounds a month. Yeah. <clears throat> you guys do pounds over there, right? No euros? Uh, pounds, yeah. That's that's basically the membership for um, Spotify, <laughs> essentially. So it's, it's almost, yeah. yep, absolutely. Yep. So you get a digital diet coach in your pocket that tells you to what to eat and when. You get to pick all your favorite foods. 
Within the next several months, we are making uh, additions to the app that are going to be enormous. I can't talk about them exactly, <laughs> but they're going to supercharge the app like crazy, and it's going to be um, something really, really special, and it's going to be super valuable and effective product, and um, you don't have to pay any extra money for updates. They happen automatically, so give it a shot. Awesome. Um Thanks a lot for taking the time to chat to me. Um, I know, you know last time I spoke to you, I felt like I should be nit taking notes myself. I felt like that this time. I'm 100% going to be uh, pinching a few of your analogies that you, uh, that you used. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed um, that chat as much as I did. Uh, thanks again, Mike. Uh, thanks to everyone listening, and I will see you all next week. Thanks so much.